Thank you. We turn now to our next item of business, which is topical questions. And question number one is from Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the Scottish Police Federation describing some of the buildings in the police estate as being, quote, unfit for human habitation. Cabinet Secretary Hamza Youssef. The allocation of resources, including for the police estate, is for the Scottish Police Authority and the Chief Constable to determine. Uh, we are protecting the police resource budget uh, in real terms in every year of the current Parliament, delivering a boost of £100 million by 2021. Um, total Scottish Government funding for the SPA in 1920 is increasing by £42.3 million, bringing the annual budget, policing budget to more than £1.2 billion. That also includes, I should say, a 52% uplift and increase to the capital budget. Uh, in relation to the ongoing investment in this estate, Police Scotland will continue to ensure that in all cases the focus will remain on a health and safety first approach for all officers, staff and the public in relation to the SPF's report. Of course, I will look at that in great detail and raise that in my discussions with the Chief Constable and with the Chair of the SPA uh, tomorrow. Liam MacArthur. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The Scottish Police Federation has uncovered conditions that nobody should have to work in. Mushrooms growing in damp shower rooms, rat infestations, locked fire escapes without keys, furniture salvaged from skips, vic victims having to give officers lifts. Officers saying that they are the worst conditions they have ever seen. So is the police estate being poorly managed or has it not had the funding it needs to get the job done? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I just say, of course, this is uh, an issue of, of legacy. This predates uh, Police Scotland, but of course, Police Scotland have a responsibility and the SP have a responsibility, as they've said they will do, to ensure that uh, places of work for police officers um, are, are compliant with uh, health and safety, but also more than that, uh, are a good environment to work for. So there's no doubting that SPF's uh, deep dives into police estate um, are, are a welcome examination uh, and scrutiny of the, of, of the uh, estate across Scotland. I would reflect on what DCC Fiona Taylor uh, has said, and I'll quote her directly in response to this specific report that Liam MacArthur mentions. She says, and I quote, work was uh, undertaken immediately to remedy a number of concerns raised by the Scottish Police Federation last week, uh, as the safety and well-being of our staff is a priority for Police Scotland. A small number of officers affected by property issues raised in the noon have already been moved to temporary accommodation while improvement works are carried out. A range of options for open police station are being examined following HMICS recommendations last year. And the policing estate has been built up over the last century and we acknowledge some buildings fail to match current uh, or indeed future needs we're prioritizing the capital budget we have allocated across a multitude of competing demands to achieve as much as we can as quickly as we can and i think that shows the commitment that police scotland have uh, to the estate right across scotland but understand that it is a herculean task and of course uh, we will continue to provide them with the budgetary support uh, to help them with that task lee MacArthur. Thank you very much again. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for uh, that response, although it does beg the question as to why it took so long uh, for those matters to come to the attention of those uh, who then have taken uh, decisions. The SPF warned that these appalling conditions present, quote, significant legal and reputational risk for individual officers, the SPA and Police Scotland. It believes the Housing Scotland Act and the Health and Safety at Work Act have been breached and recommend the SPA uh, refer itself to the Crown Office for investigation. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that that would be the right thing to do? And was Police Scotland illegally operating HMOs? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, you know, I, I've dealt with the SPF on, on, on many occasions and have a good working uh, relationship with them. I'll leave them to have a conversation with the SPA and their colleagues at Police Scotland in terms of the best uh, way forward. And I'll raise it not only with the Chief Constable tomorrow, not only with the Chair of the SPA, uh, but I'll also have a conversation with the Independent Inspector at Jill Emery, uh, in relation uh, to the estates and CSAs, a role there for the Independent uh, Inspector also. I think it's really important that I once again restate just some of the context around what we're dealing with. Um, we know that 75% um, of the police state uh, is in sound condition, it operations, uh, operation, operates safely uh, with only minor deterioration, but that does leave that 25% of the estate that we know that needs uh, repair and then needs refurbishment but worth noting again that context that 66 percent of the police scotland estate predates 1980 33 of which predates 1950 so this is a, a, an issue of legacy we are investing i've mentioned the capital uplift that we're providing 
uh, and of course we are investing both locally and in national infrastructure as well as the refurbishment and repair function uh, as well. So that is not to dismiss. I think the, 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 uh, the exchange with Lee MacArthur has been a very positive one in the sense that I think these issues uh, must be raised. Uh, I'll continue to listen to Police Scotland. They've mentioned the capital allocation to me uh, on a number of uh, occasions. We responded to that with an uplift. And of course, uh, for future spending reviews, we'll continue to listen to what Police Scotland have to say in relation to this. There are four members who wish to ask a supplementary. The first, Donald Cameron, to be followed by Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, I visited Oban Police Station, which is one of the police stations that the SPF report said should be closed immediately, and I spoke with local officers. Will the Cabinet Secretary join me in recognising that despite working in such horrific conditions, they remain committed to performing at the highest levels of service? And what message does he have for these officers, given that things have got so bad under this government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, in the first part of his question, I recognise the outstanding contribution of our police officers. I don't just say that uh, by mere words. We demonstrate that by action. Police officers have received a 6.5% pay increase up here in Scotland. I should say gently to him, with his party in charge in England and Wales, that's been a derisory 2%. So when it comes to uh, police officers and recognising the good work they do, I would say to him, actions are much more important than, than just mere uh, words. So we'll continue to, to invest, as I say, we'll invest uh, in terms of an uplift in that capital, that protection of the resource uh, budget also. It'd be helpful if we got, of course, that 125 million back in VAT that we've had to pay the UK government that no other force in England and Wales has had to pay. I've, uh, we have sent, I should say, as the Scottish Government, 15 letters to the UK government on this without resolution. So if he can give any influence to that, I suspect it will be rather minor influence with the Westminster Party. But if he has any influence with the UK government on that, I'd say to him, deeds, not words, uh, are what is needed in this case. Rona Mackay to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My question to the Cabinet Secretary was to find out whether any progress had been made in getting back the £125 million. And I, I gather from your, your previous answer that, that that has not been the case. And can I ask if that will continue to be pursued? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well it's hugely important because the UK Government did concede the principle. So they conceded the principle that was unfair. Uh, but, of course, they haven't conceded the fact that, and I see Liam, Liam Kerr shaking his head, but they, can, they did concede the principle that it was unfair, and therefore they gave back, uh, of course, uh, for one year some of that VAT, which me made sure was kept with Police Scotland. Having conceded that, uh, they have not, of course, uh, paid the £125 million pounds that they took off Police Scotland, uh, or, nor the money they took off uh, the, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, either. But, look, despite that, we'll continue to invest in Police Scotland. As I said, we've increased the capital budget, protected the resource budget. There are still challenges. That's not to take away from SPF's uh, report and their deep dives that they're doing. There are issues that we have to look at, examine and explore. I'll meet with the Chief Constable and the Chair, as I regularly do, and with the SPF, uh, and, of course, we have our future spending reviews, and those discussions will no doubt come out during those discussions. Daniel Johnson, to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary, on a number of occasions in his answers, has referred to the capital uplift in the budget this year. But it remains true that capital uh, funding for Police Scotland is the fifth lowest on a per-employee basis of any police force in the United Kingdom. Indeed, the capital budget is just 3.5% of their overall budget, whereas for the fire service, it's around 10%. So does this, these conditions not reflect that poor capital funding? And if he rejects those benchmarks, what benchmarks is he using when reflecting on the capital funding for the police force? Can I say, when I was in front of the policing subcommittee, uh, I think Daniel Johnson was saying in that committee, I was in front of the policing subcommittee uh, a number of months ago, um, I was asked about the capital allocation. And I said at that point, uh, with, 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 with the conversations I was having with my colleague on my left here, the finance secretary, that we would listen to the arguments put forward by Police Scotland in relation to the capital spend. Uh, I thought that was a persuasive argument from Police Scotland in advance of the last spending review that their capital allocation uh, didn't reflect the size of organisation that they were. And therefore, of course, I spoke to the Finance Secretary, who equally recognised that, and therefore we came forward with an uplift of 52%. That's not, a, that's not an insignificant uplift. And, and, and what I'm saying to Daniel Johnson uh, is that when it comes to the next spending review, of course, I'll continue those discussions in a very constructive manner, not just with the opposition, uh, but of course with, uh, importantly, the Chief Constable, the Chair of the SPA, uh, and indeed the Scottish Police Federation. I would say, again, gently to, to Daniel Johnson, if we went with Labour's only proposal that came forward, there would be a 3% cut to police yeah. budget, not any uplift whatsoever. John Finney. 
Thank you, President Officer. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this report shows the value of workplace inspections undertaken by staff associations and trade unions, but also a singular failure of police management? Now, you use the term pre-date. The Cabinet Secretary may or may not be aware that Loch Boysdale Police Station was closed down um, previously as a result of a Police Federation uh, inspection. The Chief Constable of Strathclyde Police found himself at Airdrie Sheriff Court as a result of a, um, a series of failings to, to enforce a safe working place. So I wonder if he'll take the opportunity to say, say to the Chief Constable tomorrow and indeed the, uh, the police authority that inevitably this is going to end up when someone, the Chief Constable, in a sheriff court if we don't resolve the deficiencies of the police estate very soon. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think before we rush to, 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 to that particular stage, that particular step, I, I know that the Chief Constable enjoys a very uh, positive and constructive relationship with the Scottish Police Federation, um, and, and, and therefore I've got no doubt of his commitment um, to, to, to trying to resolve this issue as best he possibly can. So uh, I certainly have confidence and the Chief Constable and indeed the Chair of the SPA to work with staff associations uh, to, to, to resolve this issue as best they possibly can. No doubt they'll also come to government in relation to their ask uh, around the capital uh, allocation. And again, as I said, we will uh, discuss that in future spending review uh, discussions. What I would also say is I agree with John Finney about the importance of staff associations. Look, the Scottish Police Federation will challenge the government on a regular basis. They have every right to do that. That is the job to represent their members and, and, and to pursue uh, in, in the interests of their members. So I have no uh, issue with that whatsoever. Uh, I enjoy uh, the relationship I have uh, with Callum Steele and, and indeed uh, Andrea, um, uh, the, the, the chair of, of, of the Scottish Police Federation. Um, but, uh, I, and I will sit down with them in relation to their latest report. Uh, and they know that my door is very much always an open one. Thank you. Question number two, James Kelly. Thank you, officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has carried out and the potential impact on businesses across Scotland of no longer using the pound. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Hey, firstly, our proposals are to keep the pound in the immediate term, and an SNP Government will take steps necessary to enable the Scottish Parliament to authorise the preparation of a Scottish currency as soon as practicable after independence. The Sustainable Growth Commission, established by the First Minister in her capacity as SNP leader, produced a detailed report on the financial, economic and regulatory requirements necessary for the transition to an independent currency. It engaged extensively with businesses in developing its recommendations. It recommended the introduction of six tests to guide that transition, one of which is the financial requirements of Scottish residents and businesses. Those tests were backed by SNP conference on Saturday. Our position is clear. Until a new currency can be safely and securely established in the interests of the whole economy, the currency of an independent Scotland should continue to be the pound sterling. James Kelly. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, the principal objective of the SNP government and SNP party uh, is to achieve an independent Scotland where the pound would be immediately replaced by a new Scottish cur currency. The effect, the effect that this would have on people's mortgages, savings and pensions is that they would need to be converted into a new currency from sterling at a cost of up to 30%. This would have a catastrophic impact on business and the economy so why does the Cabinet Secretary think it is credible to adopt a policy of dropping the pound that will make Scottish families and businesses significantly worse off? I think, uh, I think uh, having been placed as uh, Scotland's Finance Secretary, I was on the Growth Commission, I was at the party conference that endorsed the uh, policy at uh, the weekend. Of course, I was uh, in uh, attendance and I was a co-author of the resolution that I uh, was delighted was passed. Actually, what was passed is an economic strategy that shows the benefits of independence, how we grow our economy and deliver a fairer society. And I am now delighted that even James Kelly is scenario planning for Scottish yeah. independence. Yeah. I'm delighted by that uh, conversion. No wonder with all the most recent polls suggesting that Scottish independence, of course, is is more popular now and it's gaining momentum. And incidentally, I think it's quite healthy for parties to have that party democracy. Maybe the Labour Party would benefit from that as well. We have set out 
in terms of currency, the position that we continue with the pound. We've set out the test that will guide our decisions. It will be for an independent Scottish Parliament when the time is right, if there is that change, based on the right economic position for Scotland. And of those tests, fiscal sustainability, central bank credibility, financial requirements of Scottish residents and business, sufficiency of foreign exchange and financial reserves, fit to trade and investment patterns, and correlation of economic and trade cycle. These are sensible tests that would guide such a decision. And I will take no lectures or lessons from the Labour Party on fiscal credibility. They can't even put an opposition budget together, never mind run a country. James Kelly. Well, in addition to the disastrous proposals in currency, we know the effect of the SNP Cuts Commission would be a decade of austerity, piling cuts onto local communities. And what people and businesses want is they want a government that's going to start to deal with the issues that matter, rather than wasting time on promoting another independence referendum. So will the Cabinet Secretary discard these proposals and focus on delivering an NHS that serves patients instead of leaving them on waiting lists, an education system that gives pu pupils proper subject choice and a rail system that puts passengers first and gets the trains running on time. Cabinet Secretary. It is this government that is investing more in the NHS, more in education and more in rail than the Labour Party would have been. And when we look at the small advanced uh, economies around the world, we see what is it they've got that makes them so successful that we've not got? And the answer is independence. It is with independence that we can grow our economy and have that fairer society. But let's talk about the day job. Let's talk about the current economic uh, indicators. Record low unemployment in Scotland right now at 3.3%, outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. GDP growth that's outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. Increases in exports that's outperforming the rest of the United Kingdom. More investment in enterprise research and development, productivity improvements, as well. So we are doing as much as we possibly can with the devolved powers, getting on with the day job, building a stronger economy. But we could do even more with the powers and the levers of independence. And that's why we seek those powers for this parliament to get the best for our country rather than be left in the hands of the Tories, who are the biggest threat to Scotland's economy right now. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, very simply, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and for the benefit for, of those watching at home and those in the chamber, particularly for James Kelly, because he obviously needs to catch up, will the Cabinet Secretary uh, confirm that the currency the people of Scotland will use the day before an independence vote would be the same currency that we used the day after, the day after that, and the day after that, namely that being the pound? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, uh, Bruce, Bruce, uh, Bruce Crawford. Much to the concern of the unionist opposition is correct. The currency will remain the pound upon independence, and that will only change when an independent Scottish Parliament endorses such a change. And our policy is that we will support a change as soon as it can be done safely and securely in the interests of the country, the economic interests of the country, determined by an independent parliament when the time is right. But we need those powers of independence to be able to match the best performing economies around the world who are independent, and that's what we seek for Scotland. Murdo Fraser. Presiding officer, well, it's only been three days since they voted at this conference, and already the cabinet secretary is in full retreat from the position set out at that conference. But we know that um, the largest export market for Scottish business, for goods and services, is the rest of the United Kingdom. What estimate has been done of the extra transaction costs that will apply to Scottish businesses if they have a different currency operating here compared to their major export market? I'm afraid that uh, Murdo Fraser, whose weekend viewing was clearly not SNP conference, which I was at, which went through in great detail what our position was, uh, which is what I've outlined, uh, that we will be keeping the pound on independence. And of course, we can build our options as an independent country. We've set out the test that we would apply uh, to any potential change of currency. We've set out our preferred position. And we've also shown, really importantly, how our economic policies would be enhanced if we had the powers 
of independence that would grow our economy, deliver greater fairness and empower us to make the right decisions by the people of Scotland. We'll also be building those financial institutions with independence that would advise the Parliament and the government of its time, rather than being left to the vagaries of UK economic policy, which is disastrous for the people of Scotland. Thank you.